Welcome to the sixth of our seven fall 2027 talks. We'll have one final seven talk next Wednesday at four with Sagar Shukla, class of 2015. And then on November 18th, we'll wrap up our fall virtual event season with a discussion session about responsible philanthropy with Britt Lake in the class of 2003. And as always, we'll send out reminders on the mornings of any of our virtual events so you can wait and click in then if you'd like. Today's seven speaker has had a long journey to get here. <laughs> Andrew Buchanan, class of 2023, is one of two scholars selected to be seven speakers at the West Coast Alumni Symposium in March. And to win one of these coveted spots, he had to put in an application uh, and a proposal. And then as one of several finalists, he had to actually audition uh, to win his spot. So when the symposium was canceled, uh, Andrew did agree to give his talk by Zoom as part of um, our fall series. And we're really excited that he's here to tell his story now. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Megan. Um, and also thank you everybody for being here. This means a lot. I know y'all spend a lot of time on Zoom, so for taking this time to come listen to this talk and be here, is, it means a lot to me, so thank you. And when I was writing this talk um, six months ago, I was actually writing it for a completely different world. I was hoping to impart some wisdom. I was hoping to draw on my experiences, you know, driving through Mexico and sailing the Sea of Cortez and camping in the West Indies and hiking 120 miles through the Himalayas and hitchhiking through Tibet and riding old Soviet era trains through Uzbekistan and camping in Kyrgyzstan. I had some really out there experiences and I wanted to piece together parts of these adventures um, to hit home this idea of the importance of intentional serendipity, intentionally letting go of some degree of control to set yourself up for a spontaneous adventure. But now that I'm looking back at it, um, post COVID, I'm realizing that everybody here has had their lives completely uprooted and we have all lost some degree of control. And to build on that, like it's an election year, there's a lot that we don't know that's happening. Um, so I modified this talk a tiny bit to address all of those points. Um, but I wanna begin by telling you about something that happened to me a year and a half ago. So a year and a half ago, I was in a completely different world again. I, was, I woke up at 7 a.m. and I got in a van and I was in Tibet. I was pretty stinky ragged. Um, I've been hitchhiking for a couple of days and I was I was in a really remote part of the Tibetan plateau that's heavily militar militarized by the Chinese government um, and I was invited to attend what's called a sky burial um, and I had a massive I was incredibly honored to even be invited to this event and but it was also a really intimidating event because what happened was um, it's someone's funeral and monks came um, and prepared the deceased um, in, a, in a traditional manner and had prayers and celebrated the person's life and then systematically dismembered this corpse um, with knives and axes and hammers and fed those pieces of the corpse to hundreds of enormous vultures. Like I'm not making this up. This happened to me a year and a half ago. And this experience was so momentous in my life. Um, and I started thinking, you know, how the heck did I end up in that predicament? You know, when I was writing my gap year uh, grant request, I didn't write like, dear Chuck, I would love to receive the gap year grant so I can go to a funeral in China. Like that was nowhere. I don't even think that would have been approved. Yeah, I ended up with this experience that changed my life forever. I mean, it was at that moment a year and a half ago, you know, partway through my gap year that I realized this is how I want to be traveling. I want to be traveling, hopping from experience to experience that completely immerses me in something unexpected and intimidating and, and, and brings forth these personal connections because I was invited to that um, burial due to a connection I made with a, my hostess. And we had a really remarkable relationship um, and friendship across cultures and across language barriers. And I really wanted to catalyze more of these experiences. So in order to understand how I ended up in that really bizarre, like out there experience, I have to rewind like three days before I, I was in the capital of the Sichuan province um, and I bought a bus ticket to a town that I couldn't pronounce. I didn't know it at the time, but I barely had enough money to get by and there were no ATMs. Um, and the language barrier was also gonna be a new challenge because I speak Mandarin, but I don't speak Tibetan. And the, the major dialect of the region I was going to um, is Tibetan. So by leaping into the situation and strategically letting go of some degree of control, I was relying on the people that I would encounter in, the, in Tibet. 
And this formula, I mean, I wouldn't recommend it for everyone all the time. I wouldn't recommend going to somewhere without money and where you don't speak the language. Like that's sustainable sometimes. Um, but that formula worked for me on my gap year. And that actually led to some really um, other unique experiences that I had riding Soviet era trains through Uzbekistan um, and getting to observe the first day of Ramadan with new Afghan friends and then camping in a contested glacial valley in Kyrgyzstan um, by taking a Russian paratrooping van five hours through the countryside. And we were dropped off and said, okay, I'll be back here in five days. Like there's nobody around, literally nobody around, but I have to be back at that spot five days later. So those challenging, adverse, um, remote situations actually ended up being the, the best stories of my gap year. Um, and then, you know, the gap year ended and I had a lot of, I had this bank of experiences to draw upon to inform my decisions at UNC. And I was like, I'm ready for this. I can do laundry in a sink. You know, I can eat foods I can't pronounce. I can stomach them most of the time. I'm, I'm good at being homesick and getting through it. But UNC actually really humbled me. Um, and it was a different challenge. It was a challenge of routine for me at UNC. I went to the same classes, you know, five days a week. And then I had structured free time, which is this kind of oxymoron. Like I had structured time to exercise and structured time to go to the dining commons and hang out with friends. And very quickly, this routine turned into a rut. And I missed those exciting, um, invigorating experiences that I found so often on my gap year. And then one tiny moment reminded me of the importance of intentional serendipity. And it was breaking social norms in a dining hall. You know, everybody who's been to Lenore Chase Hall knows everyone's got their head down. They, it's, it's, it's business in those halls. Everyone's got their food and doesn't want to make eye contact and stakes out their territory. And it's kind of a, it's kind of this weird, like, I'd love to do an anthropological study of those because there's such a weird dynamic. But I did the exact opposite. I got my food and then I walked to a table that was full of people who knew each other, but I didn't know any of them. I put my tray down. I was like, started chatting and just said hello. Um, and for me, that was actually as intimidating as le getting on a bus to a, a city to bed that I had, I couldn't pronounce. Like that was equally intimidating with breaking the social norm. And my, vulner my degree of vulnerability was not unrecognized by those people. The people at the table were incredibly kind and actually like started chatting back and forth. And I got the same essence of excitement and spontaneity that I felt so much on my gap year. And then a second way I found the same energy was from biking. Um, I do triathlon and I really love endurance sport because it's, it's a lot of type two fun, which is, you know, fun in hindsight, it's delayed gratification. But even, even something like biking can become dull if you do the same route over and over and you know what to expect and you know every pothole. So to mix things up and, and purposely let go of some degree of control while I'm in Chapel Hill, I would go on my bike and go without GPS way into the countryside to, without, you know, I'd hopefully have enough water and food because that's important, but I'd get lost. And then as soon as I got lost, I'd have to try to navigate home on my own. And by being lost and like genuinely submitting some degree of control of that situation, I paid way more attention to my surroundings. I was observing the roads. I was observing the town names and the houses. And I saw stuff I never would have seen otherwise if I'd just done the same old route. Like I witnessed, you know, people target shooting on the side of the road and then like ATVs lurching out of the forest. Like I never would have seen this stuff in California or if I just hung around campus and done my same workout. So that was another another instance of finding, you know, purposely letting go of some degree of control. And this was going to be my talk. Uh, this was this was going to be my talk up until COVID. And then COVID happened. And, you know, as I was reflecting on my lessons that I hope to share with y'all, I, I found myself in another rut. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm such a hypocrite. Like I'm here to, I'm like a life coach who has his life like not in order. God, what am I doing? Like I was at home and, you know, I was kind of tired of Zoom burnout and the the anxieties of a, a world descending into chaos and a president who doesn't know what he's doing um, really got to me and I was unhappy. And I was like, wait a second, like, why am I unhappy? Like, yes, I get that there's a lot of adversity that I'm going through, but heck, I made, through, made it through some robust challenges at 19 years old overseas. Like I can get through, you know, living at home for a while. And this, I, I kind of have this internal dialogue going in my, going on in my head. And I realized that the adversity brought forth by a pandemic is bizarrely parallel to the intentionally serendipitous experiences I had on my gap year. I was vulnerable. I was vulnerable to the TP shortages. I was vulnerable to the tofu shortages. I was vulnerable to, you know, disease, my family. I had, didn't have control over everything. I didn't have control over like where I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do over the summer. Civic collaboration was up in the air. 
Um, and these are the same elements of vulnerability and, and lack of control that I actually sought out on my gap year. So, I mean, it's, it's not intentional, like this just happened, yet it has all the same elements of things that I purposely seek. And then I shifted my mindset. I was like, you know, when I talk to my grandpa, I ask him about World War II and I ask him about his dad's stories about um, the Great Depression, because adversity brings out the most interesting stories and I'm living through, we're living through a pandemic. Like these are gonna be the stories that our kids and grandkids ask us about down the road. Like this should be in a kind of off-brand way. This should be exciting like, and interesting. And as soon as I had this paradigm shift um, and started approaching it like an opportunity, um, life got more fun. Like my brother and I would sneak down to the beach at night and that was my little victory, you know, like going to somebody in the dining hall who I didn't know and starting to talk with them. Like going to the beach brought that same sort of s s micro, uh, micro level of satisfaction and excitement. I mean, I connected with my neighbors in a way that I never would have. And that was the same essence of connecting with the local Tibetans. It's like you depend on them during a pandemic, you know, to watch your back and to be responsible and maybe share food and, and reframing the problem and reframing adversity to be an opportunity ended up being this third unexpected way of thinking about intentional serendipity. So if you leave this talk with anything, I want you to think about one, pick and choose your moments to let go of control and seek spontaneity and, and lean into discomfort because really magical things happen. And two, frame adversity like a traveler because the best of times often come from the worst of times. So I wanna thank you so much for coming to this talk. Um, I'm around for Q&A if anyone has any questions and I hope that was interesting to y'all. Uh, Sarah, thank you for the claps. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Awesome. Lots of claps out there. Oh, my goodness. Oh, thank um, you. Open to questions, comments, you know, admiration for <laughs> everything Andrew's been doing. James. I, I feel like... Um... Thank you so much, Andrew. That was fascinating. I feel like I haven't heard enough about the the funeral and the vultures, and uh, you kind of went into it and then left it too soon. Um, you were saying how it kind of was a momentous moment for you. Can you just expand on that? Yeah, thank you, James. That's actually, I'm glad you brought that up because sometimes when I talk about this sky burial, I feel mixed emotions. I feel some degree of responsibility to talk about it not like a tourist who is just observing this incredible cultural um, experience that's really not seen by very many people. Um, so I want to be delicate with my language around this to not sell it as a tourist trap. But what happened that day um, was I was dropped off by my hostess and, and the celebrate it's the sky burial is as much a celebration of the person who was alive as it is like a practical disposing of the corpse. Uh, because there's there's no trees on the plateau it's it's like 12,000 feet you know no trees grow and the, the soil is frozen for most of the years so they can't bury the body so the cultures that evolved on the steppe like this landscape actually naturally just let their bodies uh, the, of the deceased decompose but the buddhists took it a step further to providing food for the vultures directly so by chopping up the body this is seen as and feeding it to the animals that's seen as one final gesture of selflessness um, and that's the cultural significance. But for me, I mean, I was invited by this hostess who I'd met um, several, you know, a day prior when I was walking through the town. I was literally going to sleep on a hillside. Like I was, it was dark and I was cold. And I met this woman who took me, uh, took me into her house and, and cooked dinner for me. And we got on chatting. And um, through her, I was invited to this ceremony. And the more people, it was a little bit, not, it was less weird than I expected. It wasn't like crashing a funeral. It was less weird because this sky burial is a celebration of the person's life. And there's actually a lot of cheer, you know, and, it, and, and picnicking that happens prior to it. Um, but I felt really awkward, you know, and this, this situation was momentous in that one, it was so out there and so different than anything I'd ever experienced and ever thought I was going to experience. And two, it showed the, the capabilities of, of in, engaging with the culture on a deep level. Um, yeah, and that day actually, that was the start of the wildest 24 hours of my life. So, I mean, the day went on to get even crazier from there. I ended up um, doing a 26 mile hike, um, you know, the next morning 
um, through around three giant mountains that are also holy to the Tibetan Buddhists. Um, they usually take a week to do on horseback, but I didn't have that time. So, I mean, that was just part of this chapter of my life that was so full of enriching, incredible experiences that it stands out and it's, it all started with the sky burial. So that's what it means to me. I have a question. Yeah, Tom. Uh, man, I, I hope I didn't miss this because I was doing a curbside pickup at the grocery store and driving home and the drivers were so bad. I saw my own vultures kind of gathering over the car. So I was able to make it here trying to listen, but avoiding everybody else. Did you, did you talk about what motivated this amazing, wonderful, crazy plan of yours? to use your gap year like this. I mean, you know, to say it's not a normal gap year is uh, kind of obvious, but uh, you know, I just finished uh, multiple rereadings of the Iliad and the Odyssey, and it sounds like you packed all, all of that into your <laughs> gap year, basically. And so, uh, you know, you have all these insights that I was writing about for 25 years in my book, Plato's Lemonade Stand, about, about it, you know, embracing what most people think of as adversity and, and scary uncertainty. In fact, I'm starting a book called The Gift of Uncertainty right now. It sounds like you're the guy I need to talk to. Uh, you, you're living this. What motivated all this? How did this get, how did this get in your brain to start with? And what made you decide to follow through with it? so that you are still living and speaking to us today? <laughs> That's a great question, Tom. I mean, most people, when they think of a gap year, they think of backpacking through Southeast Asia. And I mean, I had those novel, like surface level fun experiences too. I, I surfed a lot of good waves and I backpacked in very safe mountain ranges as well. But um, I had the Moorhead Kane to credit for this. The Moorhead Kane, as I was the first recipient of the gap year grant. And one of the requirements was that you go somewhere extremely foreign, like not English speaking, preferably not even like Western Europe. Wow. Um, so that qualification got me thinking out of the box. And then I met an alumna, alumna excuse me, named Noam Argov, and she is so cool. Um, and she actually is a film producer um, and she did a documentary on Kyrgyzstan on this family in a really remote part of Kyrgyzstan who's trying to turn their tiny um, ex-Soviet town into a tourist attraction. Wow. And her the photos and the video that she shared with me and then she were really captivating and it got me thinking about Central Asia um, as a potential destination to travel. Um, and then I talked to her on the phone and she was so enthusiastic about my traveling to Nepal and then Tibet and, and Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. She actually was instrumental in setting up uh, this grant or my traveling um, that was enabled by the grant. And the other part um, was I just have an appetite for uh, challenges. Like I really enjoy endurance sport because that's also this sense of like big challenge I want to take on over bite by bite. Um, so if I was going to do a gap year, I wanted to do a gap year that was going to really push my limits. And to a great extent, my time overseas completely broke me. Like in a most healthy growth mindset way, it absolutely shattered me. <laughs> and then out of those ruins, I, I learned a lot about myself and that was what I wanted. And then when I really couldn't take it anymore, I spent time um, surfing wonderful waves and camping with my brother and having just generic fun. So <laughs> it was a mixture of all of that, but those aren't the stories that are interesting. I had classes at, at Chapel Hill that felt like that, you know, when I just couldn't take anymore, but you, but you become something because of it. Now, were you like this as a child or, or were you like, hey, we never go anywhere. One day I'm going to make up for it. Or were, were, did you grow up sort of doing interesting things from the youngest years? Um, my mom's on this call, actually, and I see her nodding. Um, she said, uh, yes, I've been like this since a child, since I was a child. I mean, I remember very vividly being furious when my, my dad and brother were taking a trip to Peru without me. And I, was, I must have been like seven years old. And I was like, I want to go there. I want to go to Peru. And I'm a Peace, War, and Defense major. So I've, I've, I love nerding out about maps and capitals and hard to pronounce places. And I, I studied Mandarin for six years in high school. So I've had this international, like, is inkling towards all things international. Um, 
inkling's not the right word. I don't know. I've had a propensity to find weird places on the earth and want to learn more about them. Well, would um, you post then, your yeah. itinerary for us? Could <laughs> could you make your itinerary available someplace so that we could just go there and review it on, on the Moorhead Kane site or something? It would be cool to see. Yeah. You know, Tom, actually, I'll send this to everybody in the group chat. I have a travel page um, that my brother and I did because my older brother also took a gap year before going to medical school. Um, and we shot some photography together and made films and wrote a lot of reflections on that website. So it's called wow. Buchanan Project. This is awesome. I, I guess your mom wants to strap a GPS onto your ankle for the rest of your life just to keep <laughs> track of where you are, you know? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> she might not like the places i end up <laughs> that might be more stress inducing than comforting cool thank you we thank don't you. want to put you on the spot mom but if you were willing to say a word or two about what it was like from the other end we'd love to hear it i don't mind at all what was interesting is as a family we definitely traveled we're definitely super outdoorsy and athletic but even in the realm of um, the experiences we believe we gave to our children growing up. We didn't so much um, during the holidays or anything, we didn't really believe in things as much as we believed in offering experiences to our children. But I have to tell you that when a, a high school senior says to me, uh, mom, I'm going to uh, train for an Ironman. I just about fell out of the chair thinking of what that would mean as a senior in high school with college applications and everything, followed by, oh, by the way, it would be fun to do this type of traveling. And I was thinking maybe by, maybe by June, he'll think differently. But when it became obvious that it was a reality, it was a little nerve wracking to me, of, you know, as you could imagine. And I'm someone who grew up overseas and not not the easiest places to live. So um, I was nervous. My husband was 100% for it, also nervous, but 100% for it. So um, I decided to embrace it and it just, it's going to happen and we're going to just have fun with it. Um, but I always joke around with Andrew and don't hate me for saying this, Andrew, but oh, no. when he came back, I said, you left a child and you came home a man. And I really mean it because he was able to update the Buchanan project as he went along. And it was amazing to me how capable I are, <laughs> how capable I found my, my son to be. And that was, um, you know, I, I give his dad a lot of credit that he, if I was nervous as a parent, um, about certain experiences in the wilderness. He, my husband was not, he was very comfortable. And so uh, I credit my husband, I credit Andrew a hundred percent. And, um, you know, there's just something in him. And I think he's, it's, yes, I was nervous, but yay for him for doing it. And, th and now the story, and I believe this with all my heart is thank heavens he did it when he did the world being what it is today with the pandemic you know, it's kind of a lesson in not putting things off. So I'm super proud of it. That's the nutshell in hindsight. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? I've got oh, two practical also. ones. Very good. Is that Asher? Uh, hey. I, don't, I don't know if my video is working. It's kind of blurry over here, um, but I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm in hostel in Edinburgh right now. And um, I was wondering uh, what packing looked like for this huge excursion. Um, like, was it just everything stuffed in the backpack? Um, and are there any essentials to pack? Um, and also, how did you overcome language barrier? Um, Scottish accents for me are hard enough to understand. Um, so like what's just a lot of gesticulating um i have no idea how that would ever work <laughs> that's a great question asher um as far as packing goes i just came off of my Knowles course before i set off for my trip through asia so i basically packed like the essential warm clothing and i was pretty ragged um for the majority of my trip through asia um, but it's basically warm clothing sleeping bag sleeping pad um and then I brought like a phone and a computer as well, which was a little bit of higher risk, but honestly, as light as you can pack, do, 
because most places you go you can still get some things that you need like even in kyrgyzstan i was able to find like a lot of missing missing parts to my packing list um, but the essentials are warm clothes because you can't always get really nice warm clothes like that's kind of you got to get your patagonia puff beef at home and bring it or and then as far as the language barriers it was kind of funny mexico um i i grew up hearing a lot of spanish so i was okay at with my choppy Spanish, I was okay getting through the peninsula and my dad's guidance as well. Um, in China with Mandarin, I was, I was fine. Um, but then everywhere else, I was a complete like fool. <laughs> like you just have to embrace the fact that you're going to fail miserably <laughs> with translating and you can really try hard. And as long as you make an effort to learn a couple words, like genuinely make an effort to learn the local language, people will be receptive. But if you just walk up to people and start blabbing in English, it's kind of a condescending thing. That Americans do like we assume everyone speaks English why don't you speak our language like that's what how others might receive that approach so I made an effort to learn hello like and then a basic intro to my question um, and this came back to bite me a little bit though because I definitely learned I, enough Russian to get myself in trouble and to get myself lost um, so it's all part of the experience though and those puzzles of solving language barriers end up being a ton of fun like that's what I miss. I miss most just genuinely not knowing where a bus was going and trying to figure that out. Like learning the Cyrillic alphabet to be able to pronounce the city that it was going to, then ask somebody city and then point to a map. Like those are the long roundabout ways of communicating. I mean, if you spoke every language, I think traveling would be a little bit more boring. Thank you so much, profound. <laughs> Andrew, uh, Charlotte Dorn has a question for you. Yes, Andrew, this is something I've been wanting to ask you for a little bit, because just like seeing your transition from traveling globally and then, you know, having to work in a time of COVID pandemic being like stuck at home with the rest of like the United States. I'm really curious if you had a feeling of like loss and we I think we might have talked about this a little bit, but like it's difficult to go from such like insane experiences where everything's like crazy all the time, very exhilarating and like very meaningful and intentional and then um feeling like limited and like how you were able to cope you know i think i saw you posted a video about like the little things and how significant they are like the little beauties of life um and i'd love to hear more about like how you frame that in your own life yeah that's a great question charlotte i mean there's no formula i mean uh, one of the misconceptions that i think I might come off, I might try to, I might miscommunicate this, but I traveled a lot. I don't have all the answers. If anything, I have more questions. But one thing that I'm better at is understanding that my situation at the time being is temporary. Um, and, and it really, every moment is made more valuable by framing the situation either as a challenge or something you have to do and just keeping the big picture in mind. Because when I was overseas, it was really easy to get bogged down in the details of like, oh man, I'm like I, I was like very sick for four days in China and that would have been so easy to get lost in that situation as you know, this was overwhelming and terrible and painful. But the fact that I know that that experience like that was temporary, um, I, I've learned that lesson over and over on my gap year. And then I've had to relearn that lesson um, now that everything's so temporary and every situation um, just needs to be looked at and thought of in the big context of your life. Um, and then once you start thinking big picture, like this is just one chapter of my life, you can really appreciate the smaller details without being bogged down by the stressors of that moment. And it sounds like I'm really profound and like wise to say all this stuff, but I, I keep having to relearn this over and over. I am not constantly happy. Like I try to be and I'm working to improve myself, but um, it's, it's totally a work in progress for all of us. Uh, Andrew, Tom uh, Morris posed a question in the chat, which was, uh, was being an American a good thing or a difficult thing as you met others on the trip? Oh, that's a great question. I actually started telling people I was Australian um, for a bit when I was in Central Asia because, I mean, a lot of the people in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan um, actually come from like Afghanistan and Pakistan, where the U.S. doesn't have the best reputation. Um, so when I'd first meet somebody, um, I'd probably say I was like Australian or I, I could fake an Australian accent at that point in case they were that <laughs> good at English that they could pick up on an accent. Um, but then once I got to know people, I would tell them I was American. 
and I have mixed feelings about that. You know, I want to be a good steward of the United States. So if I just tell people I'm an American and act nicely, like that's okay, but it also makes you vulnerable. So as far as, you know, having some street smarts, like look homeless, tell people you're not American. <laughs> um, those, those actually ended up being pretty important. Um, but once I made an effort to get to know people and I could tell them about California, that was the other thing. I would tell people I was Californian even though I'm proud to be an American citizen, I genuinely am. I think that also in the era of Trump kind of carries like it's a double-edged sword. So I tell people I'm Californian and that almost removed me one degree from this burden of having an interesting leader. <laughs> Andrew, it's, uh, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I feel super privileged because I, you know, was in the the very beginning of this and got to hear about all of your plans and you know communicate with you throughout the process and you know seeing you get to this point but um i love the story that you told when your parents came by the foundation about when you got home from your trip and and you know kind of how you responded to walking in your room and everything would you mind sharing that uh with with the group and just kind of you know your perspective on things at that point Oh, yeah, absolutely, Montez. Thank you. And and one thing to add, but Montez was my point man the entire time. And he was so diligent about keeping communications going for my sake and a safety me, but also as a liaison to my parents to some extent, like my parents could sleep at night because I was in communication <laughs> with Montez. Um, so he was instrumental in this year as well. Um, but yeah, when I got home, I mean, for the last few months, my life was a backpack. And when I came home and saw a closet full of things I hadn't touched in years, the first day after I showered really well and shaved my beard, which wasn't much of a beard, it was like scruff, I th got garbage bags full of clothes and things like trinkets in my closet, stuff I'd outgrown and donated it all. Because I really, I mean, my room's kind of empty and it echoes now because I got rid of so much stuff, but I realized I really don't need a lot of material. Um, and that was a massive takeaway from just packing your life into a backpack for a few months. Um, yeah, and I mean, home always feels like home. It was a little strange walking in it and reflecting on how much had happened since the last time I'd stepped foot in my house. And I'm sure everybody's had that experience. You know, you go to college and your first time coming home and sleeping in your bed is kind of this weird, like I'm home, but I'm different. And that happened as well, coming home from the gap year. Um, but there really is no place like home. It, I'm still so grateful to have a room to go back to, even though it's empty right now. <laughs> Was it, um, you know, you were selected, of course, and then were the first gap year uh, fellow, basically, for Moorhead Kane. Uh, how was that coming back and having a sort of a different cohort as your, as your people? I mean, I guess it's been kind of a strange time anyway, but uh, coming back in for, for your first year, what was that like? Yeah, that was actually an interesting adjustment. An, an interesting adjustment. I was in the Moorhead Kane group me. Um, for the class of 2022, which I was admitted to. So I was able to keep in touch with a lot of people that I'd met on finals week. I mean, I see Charlie who and Charlotte and Vibhu who I'd all met over finals week. And Charlie was one of my best friends over that weekend. And we're still really close. And I think that those relationships that I initiated, um, you know, a year prior still survived. Um, but I was kind of in this limbo of suddenly having seen a lot of the world and being older and then going back to live in a dorm with people who are home, I mean, away from home for the first time and, you know, partying a bunch and like really excited to not have rules and staying up late and the things that were super exciting to them, like I had kind of gotten out of the way. Um, so there's a little bit of a disconnect with the people in my immediate surroundings. But that being said, I, I don't, that sounds really condescending. Like I made some incredible connections and friends, but there was definitely, um, I felt like I didn't have, I didn't really belong for a long time, I was at UNC. I had a lot of places I got on just fine and had friends, but it took me a little bit to find people that I really belonged with. Um, but to anybody who takes a gap year, I mean, you will come back older and a little different, but there's still, I mean, the connections that you made before the gap year with during your finalist week, like they're still there. And the beauty of going to a big school like UNC is there's a whole range of ages and interests. So you can find friends beyond your dorm if you need. Awesome. Um, Mallory has a question for you. Hi, Andrew. 
thanks so much for talking. Um, my question is about um, loneliness. So I know there's kind of a difference between solitude and loneliness. And I imagine on your gap year, you may have felt both. I'm not sure. Um, and I know that's something a lot of people are struggling with nowadays. So I'm just curious, um, you know, if you ever experienced any loneliness on your gap year and, and kind of like what your feelings are about it. Mally, that's a really good question. Um, I absolutely felt loneliness and lo loneliness punctuates a lot of solo travel. The times in between hostels, you know, you once you establish yourself at a place and make friends, the loneliness disappears. But as soon as you uproot and move to the next hostel, you're faced with that same wave of anxiety of, I don't know anybody, I don't have any friends. Um, and then you, I just got really comfortable with myself. And I, through the loneliness and solitude of a gap year, I actually realized I'm more of an introvert than I initially thought. Um, and I got a lot more interested in reading and, and I did a meditation course as well on my gap year that taught me a lot about mindfulness. And those two things, um, escapism through reading and then mindfulness um, that I did on this course by Sam Harris were both instrumental tools um, in helping me, you know, survive the loneliness. And it's real, um, but it's all temporary as well. And the more that we can be aware of how loneliness is affecting us, the less power it has over us, if that makes sense, rather than just recognizing loneliness as this is what recognizing loneliness as just a temporary state that you're in rather than the be all end all is pretty important. Okay, next up, uh, Vibhu has a question for you. Hey, Andrew. Um, so this isn't really much of a question, but I was sort of thinking back on um, like your experience and every, everything that you had, which was so amazing. And I remember, I think the first time I saw you after the gap year was I just ran by you in the pool and we said hi and I was like oh my god how, how was the gap year and then um and you're like oh my god it was amazing and I was like oh cool and then I went and took a shower but uh I, I feel like you must have had a lot of those type of encounters um where there's I mean there's so much to unpack but you have to you know condense to it in a couple words or in a sentence or you know in seven minutes um so I don't know it's not really a question it's just something that that I was thinking about um so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing, Vivu. I definitely actually remember that. Um, too bad we can't get in the pool for a while, but <laughs> that was, that's actually a good point that I've been talking about this and writing about this and reflecting about it, that to some extent, the stories of the gap year began to replace the memories of it, of the gap year itself. Like, you know, if you tell a story over and over again, you replace the vivid memories of that actual experience and the emotions associated with that experience with the words of the story. Um, so that's actually something challenging for me. I don't wanna just say the same, I don't wanna be that person at the dinner table who's like, oh, remember that time? And everyone's heard that story a million times, including myself, and I, I don't wanna do that. Um, so what helps me remember things with grave detail is going back to the photos. Like, there's nothing like photographs um, to, to really remind me of what happened, but yeah. I mean, that's, that's just a phenomenon of any interesting experience in life that you want to share. The more you share it, the more you come disconnected from the moment that actually happened. So I guess <laughs> you've been so many places. Uh, is there somewhere once the world reopens that is like first on your list to, to head back to or to head to for the first time? Absolutely. I'm going straight back to Central Asia as soon as I can. Central Asia is this cultural melting pot. You have like remnants of the Silk Road, um, like literally ancient cities that were conquered by Genghis Khan standing next to like really interesting blends of ethnicities, people who have like darker colored skin and blue eyes and a lot of like Chinese features because Central Asia sits at this crossroads between India and China and like the in Eastern Asia and as well as like the Mediterranean Middle East. Um, so it's got this phenomenal access to like different cultures and a lot of history to inform like the cities and the styles of cooking. And then on top of that, like no Americans go there. So a lot of places are over traveled by America and going there, you see a bunch of other American tourists and you feel kind of like weird, like a tourist. Um, 
but Central Asia, people will look at you weird if you say, if you start speaking in English, because it's so different. And that experience of being a complete outsider, like I want, I want that experience again. And on top of that, Central Asians are absolutely the most hospitable people I encountered my entire year. I mean, there's a lot of really kind people throughout the world in cultures that emphasize hospitality, but none like Central Asia. For instance, when I was backpacking alone through Kyrgyzstan, I was literally hiking through the mountains on my own. And every time I'd pass a year, people would like pop out and wave and try to get me to come in and eat tea and or eat bread and drink tea. And, and that sort of hospitality, I, I didn't find anywhere else in the world. So if y'all can go one place, um, go to Kyrgyzstan. It is incredible. Okay, it's on our list. Thank you. Grayson has a question for you next. Hi, Andrew. Good to see you over Zoom. Um, so obviously we're all back in school more or less um, on Zoom and you've had all these amazing experiences. And I know you've had a year at Chapel Hill or half a year um, now too. How do you find you're operating day to day, just um, having all these incredible experiences, knowing that you like being a global citizen um, and are passionate about traveling when we're, you know, going to our Zoom classes day in and day out? Like, how, how do you function day to day um, trying to somehow have all of those identities at the same time when um, all of your classes are just, you know, um, through a screen right now? Nice to see you too, Grace. And that's actually a really good question. Um, I think that my travels translated really nicely into the Peace, War, and Defense major because I'm taking geography classes and history classes um, and reading literature about places that I visited, but genuinely had no idea what was happening. I mean, even geology class, like I'm learning about the Tibetan plateau in geological terms and relearning about a lot of the world. Um, is fun because it's doing the book learning for the places that I I'd experienced on the ground, but I didn't really understand what was happening. Um, so that's one way I've kept that curiosity alive. And I remember being so excited to go to an Asian studies class my freshman year because we talk, we started talking about places that I'd visited and just didn't know the history of. Like, embarrassing, but um, so a lot of that curiosity has remained alive. Um, yeah, and then in terms of keeping the essence of the gap you're moving. I mean, that's where intentional serendipity comes in. Like I pick these little moments to purposely leap into something that I don't have complete control over. Um, and that, that excitement and enthusiasm and spontaneity is really reminiscent of my time overseas. So, I mean, those, those are some of the ways that it's translated day to day. Awesome. And uh, Tom posted another question, wondering if there are iPhones in Central Asia in the remote parts or does Apple still have work to do, he asks. Mm. Oh, that's a good question. Everyone has phones, that's for sure. Uh, but iPhones, I don't think so. No, they're pretty, no, there's definitely also a, um, the cost of living in Central Asia for me was like $7 a day. Um, so taking like 100 days of the cost of living to put towards a phone, um, I think is out of a lot of people's budget. Um, so no, I, Apple has some work to do still. But what, one thing that was really incredible is the cell coverage in China. I mean, I tell you, I was, I literally had like, I called my parents the day, out, the day of that sky barrier, like from the hillsides that had been driven into. Like it is remarkable how much technology has made its way to the far reaches of the earth. I think we have time for one more if anybody has a, a final burning question or curiosity. Well, if not, I just have to say, uh, I know everybody shares my <laughs> amazement and admiration. Andrew, fantastic uh, talk. We've really, really enjoyed it. And what a neat opportunity to spend time together on screen, but traveling the world with you. Uh, what a joy, thank you so much. And it was a treat to have your mom and your brother uh, along for the ride as well. So thanks very much. Thank you, Megan. And thank you so much for organizing this. And I, this is really a huge honor to be able to speak to you all. Um, and so thank you every single one of you who took time out of your day to come attend this. It means a lot. I really miss a lot of the faces I'm seeing on the screen. I can't wait to see you soon.